Hello and welcome back to the Pre-Ship Podcast presented by 7 Shifts. My name is DJ and I'll be your host, bringing you stories, advice, and strategies from restaurant industry leaders. On this episode, we're joined by Chef Katie Button. I'm Katie Button and I am a chef and also the owner of two restaurants in Asheville, North Carolina, Curite and La Bodega by Curite. After her restaurant, Curate, closed during the pandemic shutdowns, Button took it as an opportunity to rethink the structure of her business and how her team got paid. We go along that journey, from paying subminimum wage to a living wage and tip sharing model, and all of the challenges and rewards that come with. But first, Katie shares her unique path through the restaurant business. I studied engineering and um, almost started a PhD program before I just realized I was not enjoying life and wasn't enjoying what I was doing. And it was like, I felt like I was on this path of the rest of my life doing something that I didn't like. And I was cooking on the side to kind of get me through my studies for fun. Um, so when I, I dropped out of a PhD program, I was supposed to start. And that's my, when I started working in restaurants because I needed a job and I was like looking around and I didn't know clearly at that time, like where my life was going to take me. I just like knew I needed money. And I started applying for jobs in DC at different restaurants. And one of Jose Andres's restaurants gave me a shot and I started as a server. So I started off working in the front of the house and learning and they were the only ones who would give a PhD dropout with no previous experience a job. It worked out well for me because I got introduced to Spanish food, Spanish cooking, and um, had an opportunity then. I met my now husband working there and went and lived and worked in Spain. I worked at an incredible restaurant, El Bui. I met a bunch of the People um, got connected there and then went back, worked at one of Jose's restaurants as a cook, and then went back to Spain and worked and cooked in the restaurant. So I've done both sides of, of, um, of the restaurant, a lot of different jobs in, in the restaurant industry. Before my husband and I decided to move to Asheville, North Carolina to open Curate, our first restaurant, which we opened in 2011. And we opened a Spanish tapas restaurant because my husband Felix is from Spain and he's our front of house kind of service guy and also idea man. And, um, and I, the only professional food I had cooked was Spanish food. I'm not Spanish. It just so happened that via Jose Andres and time cooking and living in Spain, that that was where I was most comfortable. So the two of us combined kind of created this. Uh, Spanish tapas restaurant, Curate. Curate enjoyed success and accolades. As a chef, Katie was named one of Food & Wine Magazine's Best New Chefs of 2015 and has had more than a few James Beard Award noms. In 2018, Curate was named one of the 40 most important restaurants of the decade by Esquire and recognized as one of the nation's 100 best wine restaurants by wine enthusiasts. That run was put on pause when the pandemic forced restaurant closures. But Katie and her team took the opportunity to make changes across their business, one that's been brewing since even before COVID's arrival. It's something that we had been thinking about for a while, you know, struggling, one with the sub-minimum wage pay models for our front of house team where you pay them, you know, like the least that you legally can, $2.13 an hour, and then they make everything up on, on tips, which puts them very much at the whim and beck and call of whoever the guest happens to be um, that they're taking care of. And and also, you know, we were seeing um, a really large like pay discrepancy. I mean, we know we we would talk about how everybody in our kitchens and restaurant was one big team that we all contribute to this incredible experience that we're trying to offer our guests that it starts with the host, right? When the first touch that they have with the guest and then to the, you know, last glass or plate or saute pan getting put back on the shelf at the end of the night. And like, you know, the prep kitchen, everybody, the dish team, like they all work in, it's a ballet, right? That all has to be working together. Um, and if one piece is missing, the whole house crumbles, you know? So, you can't do it. It's like we're feeling this like value of each and every individual, but then we're having a really hard time with the pay structure and what goes along with sub minimum wage pay, which is then the kind of mandates, of course, for a reason of protection, right? If you're going to pay people 
$2.13 an hour, right, then they're going to be protected to receive all their tips. But it, um, it just didn't feel like a great model, you know, like, and, and we were struggling with that a lot. And when we shut down, it was really, really hard. I mean, we, I think everybody restaurant, um, has, you know, nightmares from that if they made it back or not. A lot of people didn't, but, um, it was really hard on the restaurant industry to close. And, but when we sat there, we were thinking about reopening and we were like, gosh, do we reopen the same and bring back the same kind of bad feelings we were having about the way things were going before and just continue that? Because we were having a hard time changing it while things were running. And then we were in this situation where at this point we didn't have a single employee. I mean, when we closed, we had to lay off everybody because all of a sudden we had money and then it all was, we went into debt instantly overnight when we closed our restaurant. I mean, we had, it's like a wheel. So you'd already spent, you know what I mean? The, the money that you had on the payroll in order to pay everybody. It was insane. It was crazy how devastating that was, but it, we looked at it as an opportunity to change the structure. We were like, we get to recreate these jobs. We get to recreate what they look like and their pay structure. And then all we can do is throw that back out there into the world and see who wants to come be a part, be a part of it. And we took that leap. It was really big and it's really hard. And I don't want to underestimate that type of change and how um, challenging it is. That discrepancy was most noticeable during the holiday season, where the restaurant is busier than ever. Holiday weeks are crushing, right? So in in Asheville, that's when everybody comes to Asheville, right? It's like the holidays are here and we're all going to Asheville. So like Christmas week, for example, is crushing, you know, and you're just working as fast as you can, whether you're cooking, prepping, washing dishes, cleaning, whatever you are doing, you are hustling. But then with the model that we had, the only people who were receiving the benefit of the hustle, because the hustle means that more diners are in there, right? When you're hustling that hard, it's because there are more diners sitting down. There's more work to be done. And therefore, there's more tips, you know? And the only people who were receiving that was a very small number of people. And then the rest were just having to work super hard for a lower, you know, for an hourly wage that yes, was above minimum wage, but it was nowhere near even close to what the, the other, the, the discrepancy between the two, the positions between the front and the back of the house became enormous um, because of the volume of tips that were coming in our door. And it, and it felt like we were saying to our people, you are less valuable, you know, and that just like really didn't feel right. Now, Katie knows firsthand the differences in comp from front to the back of house. She lived it in her career. But the changes she's made for her business are for good. I started in D.C. working in the front of the house. And I I remember, you know, like the the tips and things that I would bring home. Like I remember, you know, the and and that felt great. And then because my passion was always for cooking, I switched into cooking and I think, you know, and I I definitely, I remember like trying to ask, trying to get $15 an hour, you know what I mean? Like trying, like having to bargain to try to get that amount. And, you know, it was a very uh, distinct difference. I was doing it because I was excited and passionate about cooking. So at the time it didn't, I didn't mind at the moment. But then when you're like, I don't know, there's something about being an employer and looking at your people and and how you see them and how you feel and their work ethic and, you know, and, and just what's going on and how all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is messed up, you know? And, and honestly, it's the subminimum wage pay piece that has made everything messed up, you know, because it all starts with that, you know, because once you allow, you know, the subminimum wage pay, it's like, then all of a sudden, you know, the, the tips have to go to those individuals, which makes total sense, you know, but it's because you're starting at a place of not paying people for work as an employer. And 
the moment that we got out of that, it it has now opened up conversation and understanding and like um, pay visibility between our team members. And it's been a hard road for sure, like to get to that. It was, it's been bumpy, but um, the first year in particular, but um, I would not go, I will, would never go back. I mean, we're at a tip sharing model right now. Um, I would love to just do away with tips entirely, but I'm, we're not quite, we're, that's like the next hurdle, you know, and, and each hurdle is hard, you know, so you do what you can in the moment that you're in. At the center of her restaurant's new pay structure is an entirely new way of managing tips. They started with an even tip split across the board before moving into a weighted tip pool structure, all the while creating transparency around base pay rates and opportunities to improve. Basically, what it means is we apply certain weights to positions and we do give, you know, to, and we're trying to create a, a path. The end goal is to create a path for people through promotion to move up and receive more pay, you know, through the positions. That's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and, you know, the, the weighted tip pool came out of, you know, we can't totally break the system. You know what I mean? Like there is, it's, 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 it's also been there for so long and we were the first ones in a, um, casual fine dining restaurant, like full service restaurant in Asheville to go to, uh, a tip sharing model. And so, you know, that it was hard and we needed to like, think about how do we do this in a way that makes sense for us. And so the, the weighted tip pool works well, we're able to, share tips across the team, but we give a little bit higher tip percentage to those workers who do have the opportunity to sell to our front of house servers and bartenders and things like that. It, but it's still drastically improved like where we were before we implemented this. And now we've coupled that with going into this year with clear base pay rates and abilities to achieve raises that for all positions that are based on um, education and training. So in the kitchen, as you learn new stations, that's how you get potential bumps. And in the front of the house, as you learn and pass a wine test, you get bumps. And we're creating equality in those areas and in the prep kitchen and things like that. Like if you move from being peeling and cutting potatoes into recipe production, right? Where you're like reading a recipe and creating a sauce or something like that. Like there are mo moments to move up so that those base pay wages, people see opportunity to gain more money as well. Um, we're seeing it really, the nice thing is, is in the slow season also, it, it's like when you go to a tip sharing model, there aren't quite the big drastic peaks and the big drastic drops, you know, because the base wage is so much higher for, for everybody that it normalizes things for people. And honestly, they can um, therefore plan, you know, and, um, and it's true that in the winter then our, our labor percentage goes up, you know, because of that situation. But then, you know, it kind of evens out when you look at the full year. In addition to results on the pay stub, these new practices have had a positive effect on team morale in the front and the back of the house. The people in the restaurant feel they feel more connected to each other. And also they feel less at the mercy of the um, situation and potential like guest situation that they have going on, you know, like I, I think it is, they're doing a job and it is our responsibility as managers and owners to do performance reviews and evaluations of that job and offer training and development and improvement in order to develop people to make the, you know what I mean? To, to have them succeed in their job and be great as in the service industry. Um, they shouldn't like the, the, the balance of your entire paycheck being left in the hands of how someone is feeling that day does not work. I mean, it creates opportunities of harassment and racial and, and sexual like 
you know, um, assumptions and judgments of individuals and therefore like it's, it's just not right. <laughs> On the surface, of course, it sounds like something every restaurant can and should do, but that's underselling how difficult it is to make this work. It requires a lot of dedication, strength in the face of change, and the willingness to go against the grain and do things differently. Button and her team are putting in the effort every day, working with economics firms and looking hard at their food costs and menu prices to make it happen. We're like, okay, can we can we do this? And and what are these different we create these different jobs at these different rates, you know, what does that look like? Um, we also here in, um, in Asheville have a wonderful company that just economics, they like calculate the living wage rate for Asheville. And so we create a commitment to individuals to ensure that they are earning that, um, you know, amount, it, it's rounded, in, like with some tips and things like that included, but it's, but they have to make at least that. And then we're the nice thing that we've been able, the other thing that I have to say that's been, that we added into that modeling was before when we had our front of house that was getting paid sub minimum wage, and then they were getting so much money in the tips all to one small group of people is that we were kept coming up with ways to not give them benefits, right? Because it just, this was our mindset before. I mean, this is where the the thing comes up. It creates this like, um, these two parts, front and back against one another, and they can't work together. They can't be one team. They can't have one same benefits offering. I mean, we were not offering paid time off, you know, and only offering it to the the back of house kitchen. We weren't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like in order to <laughs> offset the pay disparity. And that is just also nuts. You know, like that never felt right to us either. And so we were like, no, everybody needs the opportunity to get paid time off and everybody needs sick pay and everybody needs, you know, to be able to contribute to a 401k and all of these things based on their full salary, which includes their tips. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, and, um, and, and changing the pay structure has allowed us to do that. It allows us to treat everyone in our restaurant as, employees that are all valuable. Um, it was, we've had to look at menu prices. I mean, to get at your answer of the financials, which is what you're really asking me. Yeah. But as much as you're you know, willing to, to go into. Uh... Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I mean, menu, menu prices and portions. And I mean, we, we did have to really look at that. We really have to guard because the other thing that's happened is because we now offer bene more benefits to more people. We've seen that labor percentage for our restaurant creep up. I mean, we shoot, we, it is hard for us to get under 35%, you know, on, on that, you know, to it's at 40% in the winter and where we like really are trying where we have to do that is we look at food cost, you know? So it's like, you, you just, it's like, this is important to us. How can we in maybe in the food cost and in our beverage offerings and things like that, like make up a little bit so that we can offer both eliminating subminimum wage pay and also having more benefits and across the board. And, and we're reevaluating it all the time. And I would say to people, like one thing that's been important is we did we haven't done everything all at once, you know, like we I mean, granted, we did have to do the pay thing all at once. Well, yeah. <laughs> <You can't ask. laughs> right. But, but, um, but in our benefits world, we've been adding those things back on uh, since the pandemic. Kind of little, we added those back on little by little, um, and it finally gotten back to where we were. Her team is also working to add benefits like healthcare and retirement savings to the overall compensation profile. I mean, you know, they have access to all different kinds of insurance, like health insurance, and which we contribute to. We also do we uh, do a high deductible health insurance plan, but we couple it with a direct primary care membership, which we cover half the cost of. Direct primary care is amazing. It's like a certain flat rate per month, and you get twenty four seven access to your physician. We are finding that this is changing the health lives of myself and all of our employees to have this. It, it gets it out of the insurance. It gets your 
normal day-to-day um, care out of the world of the insurance. And then you have this insurance for catastrophic type situations and and which is important. So we do those two things combined, which is really great. And then we also have um, uh, dental insurance and vision and short-term disability that's offered. And um, yeah, the paid time off and the um, sick time as well. And um, beginning accruing those immediately, you know, and, and having sick time right when you start, like, you know, those, those kinds of things that have been really um, important as well as the 401k. Katie and her team also went back to the drawing board on how paid time off is structured, making it fair for new hires while rewarding those who stick around for the long term. The other thing that we did that was really important with this tip sharing model was when people first start with us, we their PTO rate of pay is based on the living wage rate in the area, just in their first year. But then after they've hit a one-year anniversary with us, their PTO rate of pay is paid out at the average pay that they received from the previous year, inclusive of their tips. Because the story that we're trying to say is that this is the, you know, eventually we would like to do away with the tips. This is the income this is what you're looking at and we're all like you know what i mean this is all coming together and this is this is what you're receiving um and therefore your time off is worth that a big part of the strides in transparency is making the team a part of the evolution of the restaurant another way they reinforce this is by posting the tip pool breakdown for everyone to see i mean we also post weekly um daily you know the the tip pool and how it gets split among everybody. So you see everybody's tip pool and who got what and who worked how many hours. And that's really important. You know, it's it's this idea that they know that they can look through and see all the names and they see all the names of all the people who worked that day. And then they also see what that it totaled out to the total tips that came in, you know, and they can see consistency in that too. And the ebbs and flows of the season. So it becomes pre- predictable, but also um, it feels clearer and more understood. Another big piece of that transparency, using Seven Shift's tip pooling tools instead of manual methods. It's all about the fact that a software program is auto-calculating it based on their punches than us in an Excel spreadsheet. Like It makes all the difference in the world in um, people's trust. And with all of these changes comes a ton of growth. I'll let Katie tell you about it in her own words. I'm super excited about our second restaurant, um, La Bodega, which came out of the pandemic. I mean, it was something that started because we needed, we wanted like a retail shop during the pandemic where people could buy wine and, you know, quarts of gazpacho and things to go. And now it has blossomed into in the mornings. It's a cafe where you can get Spanish pastries and coffee and empanadas. And then upstairs, for, it serves an incredible lunch and dinner and wine bar, a full restaurant upstairs, along with like shelves and shelves of retail wine and Spanish specialty products. And it's just one of my favorite places. So um, please, if you're in Asheville, come check out La Bodega by Curate and also our original restaurant, Curate. Please. Thank you for joining us for the pre-shipped podcast presented by Seven Shifts. Be sure to follow us on social media for new episodes and bonus content. And as always, my inbox is open, dj at sevenshifts.com. Let me know what you think of the show, who you want to hear, or just say hello. We'll see you next time.